And I'm going to try and share my screen and hopefully everything will still work. Okay, so can everyone see that um, presentation? Yep. Yep, good, because I can't see any of you now. So that's really doing my head in. Okay. So welcome, everybody, to Coast to Corals. And, yes, we are re recording this, so um, anyone who misses it can catch up on uh, YouTube a bit later on. Okay, firstly, we'd like to... Um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're coming to you from now because we're all over the place I'm up in Bowen so we have quite a few different um, traditional owners up here and um, Abigail is in Brisbane Sunshine Coast uh, you're probably with Cubby Cubbies so um, we always acknowledge those people and um, elders past present and emerging Tonight's online event is about microbes and coral larval sediment. I'm with Abigail and we'll introduce her in just a moment. So who is ReefCheck Australia? So ReefCheck is a not-for-profit citizen science organisation uh, who relies heavily on volunteers and all of our funding comes from grants and donations. And we believe in protecting reefs and oceans by empowering ordinary citizens to get out there and do the research. It's a bit of housekeeping, um, online etiquette. Uh, we ask that you keep your videos off. Um, that's just to help with uh, bandwidth. And if you can keep um, your audio on mute, please, that's just so we don't get interruptions from um, people in the background that might be um, making a noise. Um, and feel free to use the chat and um, I'll be monitoring that once Abigail starts, uh, starts her presentation. If you're not on the mailing list, we send out a, a monthly e-newsletter. Um, you can just shoot an email to myself at seqsurveys at reefcheckaustralia.org and I can add you to that mailing list. Um, if you've got some questions that you think of while Abigail's giving her presentation, please pop them in the chat box and we'll run through those at the end. I know that if I don't write them down, I've forgot them by the end of the presentation. Um, I'm not going to bother trying to do a group photo because that's just beyond my technical capabilities. Okay, upcoming events. So Sundays with Your Mates. We have these raffles at Your Mates Brewery in Morana. I don't have the date for the next one yet, but if you follow Reef Check Australia on socials, um, the next date will pop up there and you can come along buy some raffle tickets and support us because all the proceeds from the raffles go to, to Reef Check Australia um, and they have some awesome food there and some music as well. Uh, Nurture Festival, this one at Lake Kiwana on the 6th of May. This is a festival aimed at um, families and young people in particular and it raises awareness and mental health of our youngsters. So it's a really great day out. Uh, we will have a stall there, so come along and say hi to our team. Uh, beach cleanup. At this stage, this is scheduled for the 6th of May. This is at Alma and Nellie Bays on Magnetic Island. But apparently the weather isn't looking fantastic, so we may postpone. But if you're interested, just shoot me an email and um, I can give you more details and keep you updated on whether it's going ahead or postponed. Uh, Prana Fest. This is a whole weekend of uh, mindfulness and relaxation out at Baromba Deer Park. Lovely spot out there. Uh, gets a bit chilly this time of year, but there's um, platypus in the river, so that's really cool. Um, and there's lots of breath work and, and mindfulness events for that one, and we're the charity of choice for that. Oh, back. Leaf Festival. This is the Logan Eco Action Festival at Meadowbrook Campus of Griffith University on the 4th of June. We are planning on having a team at that one. That's all about um, you know, sustainability and eco actions. And Eco Fiesta in Cairns at Munro Martin Parklands. This is also on the 4th of June. And this is a huge sustainability market that runs from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. So if you're up in Cairns, pop in and say hi. We'll have a stall at that one as well. Um, most of you are probably aware World Oceans Day is on the 8th of June. Um, so 
get out there, find some activities in your local area and join in and help out our oceans. Um, this is a big heads up. So Calandra Music Festival, again, we'll be at that one having a stall, um, lots of great music, food, fun. Uh, that runs from the 29th of September to the 1st of October in Calandra. It's always an epic event. Um, so stay tuned for tickets for that one. Next month online event, 6th of June, um, Tina will be talking to us about management strategy for the Crown of Thorns starfish on the Great Barrier Reef. Um, Terry and I were up at Holborn Island because I'm in Bowen. We went up to Holborn Island a couple of days ago and I counted at least 10 huge Crown of Thorns starfish. And I was like, oh, this is not great. So how do you get involved? We have two options. Uh, we either have our lovely ambassadors, which you basically don't require any special skills. You just have to like um, volunteering, hanging out with cool people and talking to the community and telling them what they can do to help um, with our reefs. We run a, a training course for that. And then we have our underwater survey divers and there's a few more um, qualifications required to get into that. But if you check out our website, you'll get all the information you need on not only the ambassador courses, but also the surveyor courses. And then if you'd like to you know, find out more information or know when the courses are running, shoot me an email and I can put your name on the list. Or if you don't want to do any of that, just keep an eye out on socials and our e-news for any cleanup events we've got happening and you can just come along and help out for the day. Um, and say so follow us on all of the, the social things or sign up for the e-news so you can find out what's going on. And we'd like to um, thank all of our sponsors. As I said, um, we rely solely on donations and grants. So these are our major grant partners, the Sunshine Coast Council, Townsville Council, City of Gold Coast and Port of Brisbane and the Great Barrier Reef Foundation. Make our work possible all the way up and down the coast from the Gold Coast up to Port Douglas. And a big thank you to all the people behind the scenes that make these things happen. Um, this is Terry and I doing our first aid renewal at the uh, Rose Bay Resort overlooking the beautiful Whit Sundays. It was a bit of a tough location to do a training course. Um, and Ilya's the, really the driving force behind these and she's out in the field somewhere at the moment. So unfortunately she couldn't join us. And tonight's speaker is Abigail and she's in her, oh, sorry, I've got people trying to get in. Um, final year of her PhD at the University of Queensland. Um, ecogenomics, I've never even heard of this Australian Centre of Ecogenomics, so maybe she can tell us a bit more about that. Um, and, of course, we want our aims, and she's looking at microbial communities that induce coral larval settlement. And she's a, another ring in from America, so it's great to see um, that our universities are recognised around the world. But I'll let her tell you a bit more about herself, and I will now stop sharing. There we go. All right, cool. Oh. Yeah, can everyone see my screen? Well, yep, yeah. that looks great. All right, cool. I'll just turn off my video. Oh, you can leave yours on. We don't mind if we see you. <laughs> that was okay. <laughs> um, uh, all right, cool. So hello, everyone, and thank you for dropping in to my talk. And my name is Abigail Turnland, and today I'll be talking about the work I've done during my PhD on microbes and coral larval settlement. So first, yeah, a bit of background about me. I did my bachelor's of science at San Diego State University, and I did my honors thesis with Dr. Dinsdale on characterizing whale shark skin microbiome. Currently, I'm in my finishing my PhD at the University of Queensland, and I'm currently under the supervision of Dr. Nicole Webster and Dr. Inka Van Wartenheim at the Australian Center of Ecogenomics. And my research interests include marine microbial ecology and network analysis, which I'll be talking about today. So it's no secret that coral reef resilience and growth have been compromised from the exacerbating effects of more frequent and intense climate change events. Events like cyclones, outbreaks of the coral predator, crown of thorn starfish, and elevated sea temperatures. 
Elevated sea temperatures are particularly damaging because they cause coral bleaching. Corals bleach when they are stressed and expel their symbiotic zooanthellae, and this can cause mass mortality of entire reefs in a very short period of time. So this figure here shows a coral before and after it's undergone bleaching. These events compound to negatively affect corals' ability to recover and recruit coral larvae. Coral reef growth is dependent on the coral's ability to spawn and its larvae to successfully settle and survive on marine substrates. However, coral reproductive rates have decreased alongside the decreasing rates of healthy coral cover. And at this rate, coral reef restoration is so urgently needed because coral larval recruitment will need to considerably increase for reefs to recuperate and ensure their future survival. And this is especially relevant to the Great Barrier Reef. So traditionally, reef restoration uses cloning and asexual propagation by fragmenting coral colonies to outplant on the reef. But this is not sustainable and provides little genetic diversity. So the more current reef restoration methods use sexual recruits and sexual propagation. Under this method, coral spawn and coral larvae would undergo settlement and metamorphosis in mass under laboratory conditions. This method upkeeps genetic diversity and is easily scalable to the sizes we need for reef restoration. However, there is a major settlement bottleneck because the specific environmental cues that induce coral settlement are largely unidentified for the wide diversity of coral species targeted in reef restoration efforts. Early research into these environmental settlement cues have pinpointed Crestos coralline algae, or CCA, a type of red algae commonly found on coral reefs and its accompanying microbial surface biofilm as a key source of chemicals that can trigger the settlement of invertebrate larvae. The success of larval settlement from CCA-derived cues is largely influenced by the specific species of CCA and the composition of the bacterial species in its biofilm. Further research has identified that in some instances, micro microbial biofilms alone can trigger settlement without the presence of CCA. So these biofilm communities contain bacteria, diatoms, fungi, unicellular algae, and protozoa that form on abiotic and biotic marine surfaces. Their community composition is very dynamic and will change over time and in response to the surrounding environmental conditions. Biofilm has confirmed to trigger settlement in a multitude of marine invertebrates, including coral. However, there is still limited knowledge about the specific microbial species or the gene pathways that trigger this process, and very few inducers have been chemically characterized. Many low-resolution methods, including bioassays, monocultures, and settlement choice experiments, have been used to try and pinpoint specific inducers and these methods reveal that larvae prefer to settle on older biofilms. Other studies have isolated the organic compound tetrabrome pyrrole, or TBP for short, from the bacterial species Pseudoalteromonas in biofilms that promote increased larval settlement. However, the underlying mechanisms have yet to be elucidated. These low resolution methods have trouble untangling community complexity which presents a major challenge if coral larval settlement is attributed to multiple taxa. Higher resolution tools that are appropriate for analyzing community interrelations are needed to resolve this complexity. One such tool being network analysis. So networks are a high powered form of analysis that capture the patterns of interactions between the different parts of a system. So this would be an example of a Harry Potter social network where it's untangling the relationships between different characters in the book. So breaking down this network, each character point represents a node and each connecting line or edge signifies a statistically significant relationship. Modularity refers to a group of nodes that are more connected towards each other than nodes outside the modules. So these nodes are highly structured and not randomly placed. So these modules usually share something in common. So for example, looking at this network, we can see all the protagonists are highly grouped around Dumbledore and all the antagonists are grouped around Voldemort, creating two separate modules. And lastly, a bridging node is a node that connects two modules together. 
So in this example, that would be Snape, who has ties to the Voldemort as well as Dumbledore module. So networks are commonly used across the field of ecology. For example, in this network, it depicts a food web where the species represent nodes and the flows of energy are represented through edges. With this network, it untangles the complexity of the patterns occurring in a rocky shore community, which we could do at a microscopic scale when looking at microbial communities. So by utilizing co-occurrence networks to capture patterns in the biofilm communities at different rates of coral larval settlement, we could pinpoint the inductive and inhibiting microbes, identifying reliable inducers to promote the settlement of coral larvae in aquaria would dramatically improve reef restoration efforts based on aquaculture as it would overcome that settlement bottleneck. Therefore, the overarching aim of my research is to identify specific microbial taxa that reliably induce settlement of coral larvae with co-occurrence networks. So the research I'm going to pre be presenting today is from a larvae choice experiment with microbial biofilms. And this experiment was conducted at the Australian Institute of Marine Science, or AIMS, up in Townsville. So first we had these concrete tetrapods that were deployed in the sea simulator, or a very fancy aquarium, and at Back Numbers Reef on the Great Barrier Reef, to condition biofilm microbial communities for one, two, or three months. Once the microbial biofilms were done conditioning on the tetrapods, the tetrapods were put in 24 replicate tanks separated by reef and aquarium, with one tetrapod from every conditioning month, plus a zero month control, which is just a tetrapod rinsed with sterile seawater. Aquapora tenuous coral larvae were released in each tank, and after 24 hours, the number of settled larvae were counted per tetrapod. The microbial biofilms were then scraped off each tetrapod and were characterized with 16S and 18S amplicon sequencing, looking at prokaryotes and eukaryotes. The coral larvae, seawater, and blanks were also characterized with 16S and 18S uh, amplicon sequencing. And today I'll be focusing on just the bacterial 16S rRNA amplicon sequencing data. So settlement rates of coral larvae were broken down into three different settlement level categories. The first being low settlement, which would be considered if a tetrapod had less than 30% coral settlement, medium between 30 and 60%, and then high settlement, anything over 60%. Then in order to cut down the noise of the networks, we ran a core microbiome as defined that a microbe had to have at least 0.01% relative abundance and present in two thirds of the sampling group. We ran the core microbiome separately for each settlement level in order to preserve the microbes that were specific to a settlement category. So this cut down from around 55,000 plus microbes in our network to just under 1,000. Now this is an NMDS plot looking at the variation of microbial communities across the different sampling types. As you can see here, the coral larvae are distinct from the biofilm samples, so we have no or little to no coral larvae contamination than scraping off the biofilm. Also, the biofilm conditioned in the aquarium and on the reef were statistically different, so going forward we separated these two data sets in order to make two separate networks. And for the sake of time and simplicity, in this presentation I will only be going over the aquarium conditioned microbial biofilms, but just know we did all the same type of analysis for the reef conditioned biofilms. In order to test the different settlement categories, we created this NMDS plot of the aquarium biofilm samples in order to look at variation over settlement category and conditioning month. Each settlement category was significantly different from each other using Permanova analysis. And since settlement level and conditioning time co-varied, we simplified our analysis to solely look at settlement levels and combined all conditioning times in one network to boost the network statistical power. So again, networks capture the patterns of interactions between a system. So in our biofilm aquarium networks, which is um, seen here, it's capturing the nodes that co-occur together at similar settlement levels. So for example, in this initial network here, each node or point represents a single ASV, which stands for an amplicon sequence variant, or more simply, a microbe. The connecting edges refer to statistically significant relationships, and these colors refer to the module membership. 
So in this network, there are seven different modules, and it's a very modular network because nodes of similar colors are grouping together. So these nodes are all going to co-occur co together. And the network on the right is the same exact network on the left, except we have changed the node coloring to represent a pie chart showing the distribution that that microbe has is found across high, medium, and low settlement inducing biofilms. So when we simplify our networks, it's easier to visualize that modules are partitioning by settlement category. So this sim simplified network on the right is collapsing all of the nodes in a module into a single node. And the pie chart represents the settlement distribution of all the nodes in that module. So here we can see our seven different modules a bit more distinctively. We can think of these different modules as representatives of microbial communities that induce different levels of settlement. For example, if we look at module six up here up top, it's representing a microbial community that will induce high levels of a tenuous coral settlement. Whereas this module two down here would induce low levels of settlement. So this makes it easier to narrow down microbial inducers and inhibitors by looking at specific modules. So now that we have identified that these communities and how they're co-occurring, and they induce high and low levels of coral larval settlement, we wanna know what microbes are there. So this is a log transformed heat map showing the relative abundance of each sample at the taxonomic family level. So on the top, the samples are grouped by high, medium, and low settlement biofilms, depending on what tetrapod that they were in. And then on the y-axis, we have the different colors of the different modules where that taxonomic family is going to have its highest abundance. And you'll notice here with the gaps that there's going to be certain taxonomic families that you're only going to see in high, medium, or low settlement. And a lot of the families that are specific to high sediment biofilms are rare taxonomic families. So analyzing the community composition of high sediment modules, we identified some tax of potential inducers. First, we have a Mycococcalus ASV, which was also found in microbial biofilms that promoted scallop larval settlement. Next, we had an unassigned D90 ASV that had high sequence similarity to granulococcus species which was found on CCA surface microbiomes that induced sea urchin larval settlement. Then we had an unassigned JTB23 ASV that had high sequence similarity to Pseudoalteromonas, which is also known to induce um, coral larval settlement of other coral uh, families and species. Finally, we found a Pseudovibrio denitrificans ASV that was also found in mixed and monobiofilms that induced the highest levels of the coral Leptrastia purpurea. So we also identified some potential inhibitors too. The first being an unassigned Cyclobacteriaceae ASV that had high sequence similarity to Rachin bachiella agar peripherans, which also was flagged as a potential inhibitor of tube worm larval settlement. Next, we had a Snethaliaceae ASV that had high sequence similarity to Snethalia lamellarius, which was also highly abundant in biofilms that did not induce tube worm larval settlement as well. Lastly, we had a Pleurocapsia ASV that was highly abundant in microbial biofilms conditioned under natural and anthropogenic stressors, like low water quality, and it was associated with no coral recruitment for a variety of coral families. Now, in order to look at how nodes are facilitating transitions through the network, we looked into two node metrics, the first being degree which is just the number of nodes a node is connected to. So for example, if we look back at our Harry Potter network, the node Snape has five connections. You can see that by counting the five different lines to other nodes. So the degree of this node will be five. The second network metric we used was between the centrality, which is just a calculation of how often a node is used as a stepping stone in node paths. So for example, in this network here, Snape would have the highest between the centrality because if any of the nodes in the left module wanted to travel to the right module, they would need to pass through Snape. If we were to remove Snape from this network, then these modules no longer connect and we have lost the flow between the modules. So this Snape node is pivotal for the flow of information across this network. So with our microbial networks, we wanted to find our SNAPE node. 
the nodes that have high betweenness and low degree. These types of nodes are going to be critical stepping stones in the network and are going to be facilitating the transitions between high and low settlement and vice versa. So this graph here shows each node as a point and it's looking at its betweenness on the x-axis and the degree on the y-axis. So again, we're interested in the nodes with low degree but high betweenness because even though they are not highly connected, they were still an important for network structure and flow. So these nodes of interest are found in the right bottom corner and they're assembled with this asterisk symbol. And so what taxonomic family these nodes belong to are listed here. And a lot, we have a great diversity of different uh, taxonomic families here, but most of them are Rhodobacteriaceae. So we, one taxonomic family that was facilitating a lot of these transitions was Rhodobacteriaceae. And Rhodobacteriaceae was found in studies that analyzed biofilm succession in the Pacific and Atlantic oceans. They found that Rhodobacteriaceae is a dominant primary surface colonizer, so it's usually one of the first microbes to form the biofilm. Some functions that have been linked to Rhodobacteriaceae include carbon and sulfur cycling, as well as trace metal reduction. Some clades have been found to produce aciliated homoserian lactones, which contain quorum sensing signals. Quorum signaling is the ability to detect and respond to cell population density by gene regulation. And it has been hypothesized that using this, Rhodobacteriaceae may shape biofilm community structure and development through cell to cell communication. So, this might be a tax of interest that's helping to shape microbial biofilm communities to look like the high settlement communities we found in our high settlement module. So, overall, some main takeaways from this study is that microbial biofilms induce different levels of atenuous larval settlement and have distinct and diverse prokaryotic communities. We also identified rare taxa in high sediment modules, imputative inhibiting taxa in low sediment modules that can be further tested in future sediment assay experiments. Lastly, we identified Rhodobacteriaceae as a potential important transitionary microbe into creating these high sediment communities. So I'd like to thank you guys for listening to my talk and then also a very special thank you to my advisors, Dr. Nicole Webster, Dr. Miguel Lurgi, Dr. Inka Van Wartenham, Dr. Paul O'Brien, and Dr. Laura Ricks, as well as the teams from ACE and Ames for their help and support with this project. And then also special shout outs to Dr. Emmanuel Boat, Dr. Carly J. Randall, Dr. Sarah Bell, Dr. Andrew Negri, Christina Giuliano and Lisa Kemp for their work in this experiment and helping write this paper. So if you guys have any questions, I'd love to hear them. Um, thank you for listening. Okay, that's amazing. Um, so if you want to stop sharing your screen now, Abigail, and show us your face again, that'd be really good. There we go. And I'll put my video back on. There we go. That was amazing. I I knew that um yeah we, we look at you know the coralline algae as, as a reef cementing organism, you know, cements together the rubble and makes somewhere for corals to settle. But mm. I never realized that um they were important for the biofilm on them to actually mm. you know give the, the coral somewhere to sit. Yeah. So, so I did not know that. Um also so you've come up with these like okay so this I can't remember the name of it the the one sort of microbe that you decided was probably the most beneficial for settlement can you see how like is there a way of utilizing that in the field like in situ or, or you have to like pre-treat um settlement tiles or something beforehand or yeah yeah so big picture with this because this is very like ground work um, yeah. in terms of reef restoration uh, this is more towards how do we improve coral settlement in aquariums because okay. right now we've settlement success is about only really 30 percent and even less of that coral recruits survive past then so this is just to like okay how do we encourage the coral to settle more in aquaria in terms of bringing it to the field if it is the actual taxonomic family, then we could culture that in the lab 
and create biofilms of that. And then potentially we could transport into that into the field, but also the biofilms change when you change their environment. So um, okay. yeah, so I don't know how useful this would be in like in terms of the field, but in aquaculture, um, that's kind of like our main goal. But it also could be that, so we looked at the taxonomy here. It could be just the, the functions. So it could be that all oh, the list of taxa that we say, oh, they're, this could be important. They could all share one function. So then it wouldn't really matter which uh, bacterial strain you use, as long as it does okay. the corals like, it'd be cheaper for us. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. That's good. Does anybody have any questions? You obviously just baffled them with your brilliance, I think. <laughs> um, okay, so we do have a question. Um, this may be very similar, but would promoting the growth of rhodobacteria, like they even got the name of it, be a possible technique to promote larval settlement? Um, yeah, so this is what, um, yeah, so it's, something we'll uh, have to test because this is when you're using networks, it's you're making hypothesis. So n like we can say, oh yeah, rhodobacteria same may be the one that's transitioning into these niches that create the high settlement communities. Um, but we don't know for that for sure. So you would do a similar experiment, but you would just do it on like uh, monofilms of just rhodobacteria CA. And so, yeah, that's something that we would hope would prom uh, promote uh, larval settlement, but we still need to test it. Okay. So when you're talking about, um, you know, use, using this in Aquaria, mm -hmm. is that um, to get corals to grow in Aquaria for use uh, for transplanting or for experimenting on in Aquaria or? For... For, yeah, for everything. Oh, okay. um, yeah, so especially when we have the facilities up at Ames at the Australian Institute of Marine Science. They have this beautiful world-class um, aquarium for those that don't know. And every year in October and November, um, it's coral spawning season and millions and millions of coral larvae will spawn in the tanks in the lab. But wow. 30, yeah, but 30% of those will actually settle. The rest will kind of die off. And then even less of that will survive like after a year. And so with this, our goal is to obviously produce more coral recruits. And then with that, they can use those to experiment on instead of collecting wild corals from the field, which can be unsustainable sometimes. And then like further down the line, we could definitely use those in transplanting corals back to reefs that um, are a bit degraded. Excellent. Thank you. Now. Um, so Karen has asked, Karen's one of our, our regular listeners. Mm -hmm. um, hi, Karen. So she's seen posts on Facebook about coral larvae settling when sounds of the reef are played. Is there any truth to this? Yes. So coral are funny. Coral, uh, <laughs> depending on the species, they settle to different things. So uh, microbes are some coral settle to it better than others but also the physical contact with the CCA itself and maybe the chemicals that that's releasing, also light and sound as well. So there's a lot of environmental cues that are going into it. And so that's why the sediment bottleneck has been really hard to try to answer is because there's just so many different environmental factors that could be contributing to this. So yeah, there is truth to the sound. Oh, that's cool. Who mm -hmm. knew they listen to music? Um... Okay, so Islan has said, do you think there'd be different ideal nodes for different reefs due to alter, alternating environmental variables? Yes, so even, so I only talked about the aquarium network today, but we also did the same with the biofilms conditioned in the reef. And those networks were different and they shared very little ASVs. And so at the ASV levels, like the bacterial species level, um, the high settlement communities were different between the two. Um, they did share some similarities in at the family level, um, but it was still pretty unique to where we did the biofilms from. And so that's where you get of, okay, are we trying to find what is 
causing coral larvae to settle in the field, or are we trying to find what it's settling in the lab? And so for the purpose of like improving coral aquaculture, we were really interested in, okay, in these lab conditioned biofilms, what's causing the A-tenuous to settle? Okay, thank you. Now, so Helen has said, oh, what are these things popping up annoying me? Um, fantastic presentation. You're probably looking at this chat anyway. Can you please elaborate on the quality of the micro, bio micro that settles and how it affects the coral take up, e.g. water quality. Ah, uh, yeah. So biofilms are really dynamic. And so a biofilm that's conditioned in, let's say, low water quality is going to be very different than a biofilm that conditions in high water quality. And you even see that with like the different ages that biofilms are, the three month, those older biofilms, they're gonna induce a lot more coral settlement than the one month early young biofilms are. And so with this specific study, um, I can't tell you how coral larvae settle in regards to like a low quality versus high uh, quality water biofilm conditioning. However, I would guess that the bacteria that's going to be in that high quality water biofilm conditioned is going to be more of the bacteria that like a tenuous likes because in uh, water with low quality, it's going to be a lot of pathogens like Vibrio. Um, we see that in CCA, their surface microbiomes, they're different. Um, and it's going to, and some coral diseases are linked to certain bacterial um, species, and you're going to find a little bit more of that in the low quality. So I'd assume that it, high quality biofilms would be better. So that was a roundabout answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Wow, thanks. Great explanation. There we go. Okay, so there we are. Karen wants to know if the biofilm is affected by the water temperature. Yes, it is. You'll find, yeah, uh, there's a lot of um, even biofilm, like on different hosts, like example, CCA, their surface is coated with bacterial biofilm as well. And you'll see the same species of CCA conditioned at different like pHs and different temperatures. The community will be different. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. and that also affects coral larval sediment. Yeah, okay. So too hot, too cold, or is it just the difference in the biofilms? Well, yeah. So this was a study done actually by my advisor, uh, Nicole Webster. And from memory, the higher the pH, uh, it does change the biofilm on the CCA and the less coral settled on it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. All right. Well, I certainly learned something tonight. I didn't know that. Not to mention all those huge names you're working with with <laughs> microbes. I mean, I do nudie breaks and people go, oh, how do you know that you know the scientific names of those? But they're easy compared to what you're dealing with. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so and does anybody else have any more questions? No. No. Looks like you've answered everybody's questions. Um and obviously, if you think of something a bit later, um, feel free to shoot it through to me and I can pass it on to Abigail and um, she can send you an answer. And don't forget, if you want to go over that all again, this will be up in YouTube uh, in a couple of days. So I'm going to stop recording now.